achieve on their sons, but Kierkegaard Sr. was different. He felt driven, but he no longer had any goals. He saw himself as accursed, and he wallowed in total despair. It was this driven despair that he wished, consciously or otherwise, to impose upon his son. In his later journals, Kierkegaard Sr. pointedly tells the story of the man who gazed at his son one day and told him, Poor child, you are living in silent despair. This would seem to derive from an autobiographical episode, or was possibly a regular refrain. Not surprisingly, Kierkegaard was a somewhat odd pupil at school. He dressed in buttoned-up old-fashioned clothes and behaved in a buttoned-up old-fashioned manner. His teachers described him as being like a little old man. He didn't excel at schoolwork, though he was certainly in a different intellectual class from his fellow pupils. His father had instructed him not to draw attention to his intelligence. He was to place third in his class. Young Soren dutifully obliged. This must have required even more skill. Any budding genius can come in first. As Kierkegaard grew older, it became plain that his odd appearance was due to more than just his old-fashioned clothes. His body was angular and stick-like, and he seems to have suffered from a spinal disease which gave him a slight hunchback. Never one of the gang, the outsider Kierkegaard inevitably attracted the teasing of his more boisterous schoolmates. He soon learned to defend himself with a sarcastic wit. This sarcasm he then began to use aggressively, provoking other boys with his comments and attracting their bullying. This behaviour trait was to recur throughout Kierkegaard's life. Like many an earnest introvert, Kierkegaard liked to consider himself the centre of attention. He was certainly used to being the centre of his father's attention, and the fervent intensity of his inner life meant that he was very much the centre of his own attention. Provoking others, even if he suffered for it, reinforced the illusion that the world revolved around him. This martyr complex was to become an important factor in his psychological makeup. After leaving school, Kierkegaard enrolled at the University of Copenhagen to study theology. Here he seems to have been a surprisingly normal student. Quickly recognised for his wide-ranging erudition and waspish wit, he cut quite a figure in the student circles of provincial Copenhagen. He soon found himself neglecting the study of theology in favour of philosophy. He became interested in Hegel, whose philosophy had spread like the plague throughout Germany, and was now reaching epidemic proportions in various lesser philosophic nations. Hegel's deep seriousness and earnest, spiritually oriented view of the world struck a chord in Kierkegaard. According to Hegel's all-embracing system, the world developed according to a triadic dialectical process. An initial thesis would generate its antithesis, and both would then be subsumed in a synthesis, which in turn was seen as a thesis, and so on. His classic example was thesis, being or existence, antithesis, nothing or non-existence, synthesis, becoming. By means of this dialectic, everything moved toward greater self-consciousness, and ultimately toward the absolute spirit, which subsumed everything as it contemplated itself. This all-embracing absolute spirit even subsumed religion, which was viewed as an earlier stage of the ultimate philosophy, that is, Hegel's. The appeal of such a philosophy to the introverted Kierkegaard is obvious, not least in its Oedipal, religious, and narcissistic aspects. Although Kierkegaard was overwhelmed with admiration for Hegel, his relationship toward him was suitably dialectical from the start. He loved him, he hated him, and ultimately his own anti-Hegelian philosophy was to be suffused with Hegelian concepts, not the least being Kierkegaard's own version of the dialectic. But more important, right from the start, Kierkegaard had doubts about the absolute spirit and its self-knowledge. For Kierkegaard, self-knowledge had to be achieved at the subjective level. He insisted that for individuals, the subjective had to be more important than any absolute spirit. The subjective realm was our major concern. Some resourceful commentators have detected unconscious echoes of Kierkegaard's relationship to his father in all this. And sure enough, the young subjective element was soon to find itself in opposition to the paternal absolute spirit. Around this time, Kierkegaard's relationship with his father underwent a dramatic change. 
By way of passing on the family curse, Kierkegaard Sr. appears to have made a number of confessions to his intense and impressionable son. He explained how he had cursed God long ago on a hill in Jutland. Kierkegaard is said to have recoiled from this revelation in horror, and soon afterward began to drift into a drunken, dissolute life at the university. Some perceptive commentators have suggested that there is more here than meets the eye. By this stage, Kierkegaard was probably looking for an excuse to break free of his father's overbearing influence. It also seems certain that the pious old man's confession included more than just theological matters. He may well have confessed that he had committed fornication, sleeping with the maidservant, his future second wife, Kierkegaard's mother, while his first wife lay on her deathbed. This could also help to explain the dramatic, or self-dramatized, turn in Kierkegaard's behavior, which was not quite as dissolute as he would have us believe. But it has also been suggested that the father's confessions contained something more serious than infantile blasphemy and earnest guilt over peccadilloes. In the view of critic Ronald Grimsley, covert references in Kierkegaard's journals hint that the father had visited a bordello and contracted syphilis, which may even have been passed on to his son. Kierkegaard's subsequent behaviour certainly doesn't rule out this lurid possibility. As part of his campaign of dissolute behaviour, which included such heinous sins as drinking rowdily in cafes and walking down the main street smoking a cigar, Kierkegaard now visited a bordello. As is more frequently the case than most would care to admit, this initiation was a fiasco. Later that night, Kierkegaard scribbled incoherently in his journal, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That bestial giggling! In extremis, Kierkegaard identified with the words of Christ on the cross. Although he had attempted to flee his religion, it remained his spiritual reference. This was to be Kierkegaard's sole sexual encounter throughout his life. Later remarks in his journal suggest that this was more than a cliché humiliation. He writes of being denied the physical qualities required to make me a whole human being. In other places, he frequently refers to his thorn in the flesh, and at one point mentions a disproportion between his soul and his body. We can only guess at the precise details of this very personal misery, which would seem to have involved sexual impotence. Some have claimed that all this sidelines Kierkegaard, making his entire life and works a special case. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Much more plausible is the argument that this personal misery acted as a constant goad, increasing his suffering to the point where he became more intensely human. Paradoxically, it served both to detach him from life and, on another level, to plunge him more intensely into it. His continual misery made him even more aware of both the futilities and the profound implications of the human condition. In the spring of 1836, Kierkegaard suffered a crisis of despair. He was overwhelmed by a vision of his inner world which he saw as utterly corrupted by cynicism. The sarcastic cigar-smoker who entertained his friends masked an inner abyss. He began seriously contemplating suicide. On May the 19th, 1938, Kierkegaard had a spiritual experience which he referred to in his journal as the Great Earthquake. Only now did I find some relief in the thought that my father had been given the hard duty of comforting us with the consolation of religion, of ministering to us all so that a better world might be opened to us, even though we lost everything in this one. The way was now open for his return to God and a reconciliation with his father, but only just in time. Three months later his father was dead. The way Kierkegaard saw it, his father had died so that, if possible, I might turn into something. Kierkegaard's powerful imagination often caused him to mythologize events that affected him deeply, but in this way he gave his life meaning. The death of Kierkegaard's father left him with a considerable fortune of more than 20,000 crowns. Kierkegaard calculated that this would last him 10 to 20 years. Overnight, he became one of the richest and most eligible young men in Copenhagen. For almost half a dozen years, Kierkegaard had resisted at taking his university exams, mainly because his father wanted him to graduate in theology and become a pastor, a prospect that hardly appealed. But now all this had changed— 
by a characteristically perverse piece of dialectical reasoning of the sort that Kierkegaard was to make his own, he persuaded himself that because he was now free of his father's coercion and financially independent so that he had no need to work, he owed it to his father to pass his exams. For two years Kierkegaard studied hard, living an upright Christian life. During this period he met a teenage girl of a good family named Regine Olsen. Although Regine was ten years younger than Kierkegaard, he formed a deep attachment to her. He courted her in the formal manner of the time, sending her books and reading to her, escorting her arm in arm down the esplanade on Sunday afternoons. Regine was dazzled by her wealthy suitor, whose brilliance and social graces appeared tempered by a hint of enticing melancholy. Kierkegaard's attachment was equally deep, but remained entirely spiritual. In her innocence, Regine hardly noticed this. Such behaviour was considered quite normal in decent Danish society. The physical side of any relationship came later, and woe betide any suitor who thought otherwise. Despite her naivete, it soon became clear to Regine that she had fallen in love with no ordinary young man. Kierkegaard was meticulous about the books he gave her. He insisted on discussing the ideas in them thoroughly, instructing her on the correct way to interpret them. It seems that Kierkegaard wished to dominate the seventeen-year-old Regine as thoroughly as his father had dominated him. But Kierkegaard was not made of the same dour stuff as his father. Something in him sensed the wrongness of this, the wrongness of the entire situation. Still, he loved her. Sometimes he broke off reading to her, and she would notice that he was silently weeping. The same occasionally happened when Regine played the piano for him. As she put it, Kierkegaard suffered frightfully from his melancholy, an observation that was to prove as tragically prophetic as it was touching. After Kierkegaard passed his exams, they became engaged, and Kierkegaard began training to become a pastor. A normal life beckoned. But Kierkegaard was incapable of living a normal life, and he knew it. Spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, physically. On almost every level such a life was impossible for him. Yet the impossible had happened. He had fallen in love. Regine had become so much more than the spiritual protégé he had intended. At the same time, Kierkegaard felt himself drawn to a life beyond the normal, to a higher life. As yet he didn't fully understand what this life was. All he knew was that he wished to devote himself to writing, to philosophy to God, and for this he felt instinctively that it was necessary for him to sacrifice everything else. Within two days of his engagement to Regine, Kierkegaard knew he had made a mistake. He tried to break it off as gently as possible, but Regine didn't understand. He sent back her ring. Still she didn't understand. She knew that he loved her. A tragic farce ensued, one which was to preoccupy Kierkegaard until the end of his life. For years he would analyse, fantasize, delude himself, and dissect his reactions with heart-rending honesty. The more he worried over it, the more profound his thoughts became. What began as an agony of choice was eventually to become the agony of choice, the dilemma that faces all humanity. What am I to do? became universalized into how are we to live? Kierkegaard now had the two subjects which were to generate his philosophy, his father and Regine. In the crucible of neurosis, obsession, and suffering, the base metal of his inadequacies would be transformed into the essence of the human condition. After Kierkegaard finally broke off his engagement to Regine, he fled to Berlin. He was to remain there for a year. During this period he attended lectures by the romantic idealistic philosopher Schelling, who was determined to free German thought from the spell-binding influence of Hegel. These lectures attracted a wide-ranging audience, including Bakunin, the Russian anarchist, Burkhardt, the historian who first elaborated the full cultural import of the Renaissance, and Engels, the other half of the famous political duo with Marx. Like Kierkegaard, these tyro geniuses were seeking to rid themselves of the all-pervasive influence of Hegel. They all ended up dismissing him, yet were nonetheless lastingly influenced by him. But Kierkegaard was disappointed. Schelling had missed the point. He hadn't understood that Hegel's philosophical system, and indeed all philosophical systems, were now a thing of the past. A system built on rational principles, as any system had to be, described only such aspects of the world as were rational, 
Kierkegaard had understood, and experienced to the full, the fact that subjectivity was not rational. When Kierkegaard returned to Copenhagen at the close of 1842, he brought with him a voluminous manuscript entitled Either Or, A Fragment of Life. The title's autobiographical reference is immediately apparent, yet when he published this work it was under a pseudonym, or more precisely, a series of pseudonyms.